Good morning. Welcome to Chalice Unitarian Universalist Congregation. We are a community of diverse beliefs and experiences, nurturing the liberal religious spirit and united by our desire to grow in love and in service. Whoever you are, whomever you love, whatever your life's journey, you are welcome here. Whether you gather with us every Sunday, once or twice a year, are with us this morning for the first time, or are watching this video on uh, recorded on YouTube. <laughs> we are glad you are here. I'm Reverend Sharon Wiley, Chalice's minister. Our worship musician this morning is Justin Gray. Welcome to this online worship service. Please notice on your Zoom menu that uh, there's a button that says CC Live Transcript. This is our closed captioning service. If you, you can click on it to hide the subtitle if you don't want closed captioning showing, or you can show the subtitle if you want uh, that function on. Also on your Zoom menu is the chat button. Uh, for those of you who like to use the chat box during the service, you're welcome to do so. And uh, you'll see people saying good morning and greeting each other right now. Please be sure that when you post that you've used that little blue menu to select panelists and attendees. Uh, if you only post to panelists, it only comes to me and I probably won't see it during the service. We want everyone to be able to read and enjoy each other's sharing. So this is me greeting you, <laughs> standing on our courtyard outside our little chapel, giving you a big hug of welcome with your consent. Um, you're uh, encouraged to give yourself a hug of welcome. If you share space with someone, maybe give them a hug too. I want to especially welcome those of you who are newcomers at Chalice. In addition to this online worship, uh, we have many groups and activities that are happening online as well using Zoom technology. Activities like our women's book club, our men's breakfast group, support groups, religious education for children, all of these and more happen online. You don't have to be a church member to participate in our groups and activities. They're open to everyone. So if you're new to Chalice and would like to learn more about our activities, if you have any questions, you're invited to stay here in this Zoom worship after the service, and we'll use the chat box uh, to have a newcomer chat. Now, let's take a breath together. Good morning. According to the Library of Congress, the first permanent Euro-American settlements began a pattern of displacement and land appropriation of indigenous people that continued until the 20th century. In this region that we consider home, the Kumeyaay first lived here for over 10,000 years and were the people who greeted the Spanish when they first sailed into the San Diego Harbor in 1542. With this awareness, we acknowledge that Chalice is located on the stolen tribal ancestral homeland of the Apai, which is part of the Kumeyaay Nation, and the Payamkawicham Nation. This acknowledgement reminds us that we live in a history-driven present and that we need to be intentional with this land and with the people indigenous to the land. Mary Lyons from the Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe states, when we, the indigenous people, talk about land, land is part of who we are. It is a mixture of our blood, our past, our current, and our future. According to the research done with Reclaiming Native Truth, 40% of Americans do not believe that indigenous people still exist in the U.S. Chalice hopes that with our first step of land acknowledgement, we can move towards educating ourselves and others about indigenous communities and their rich and diverse culture and create a meaningful relationship with them as well. Now we light our chalice, the symbol of our Unitarian Universalist faith, a symbol of the best that we aspire to be. The flaming chalice was first used during World War II by the Unitarian Service Committee, 
as a symbol of life-saving refuge for people fleeing persecution in Europe. May our chalice flame burn brightly that all who are seeking may find us. What a blessing to begin this day together. This hour of worship, an invitation to open your heart, open it to love and hope and joy. This hour of worship, an invitation to open your mind, open it to what you may not know, may not see, may not touch. This hour of worship, a time to unlock the doors that keep us separate from one another, a time to explore new rooms, a time of welcome and hospitality, even in this online way. Come in, come in. What a blessing to begin this day together. In our Unitarian Universalist faith tradition, the time between Martin Luther King Jr. Day and Valentine's Day is known as the 30 days of love. It is a time to lift up the ways you use and many of our partner organizations are building and organizing by taking bold, courageous action for intersectional racial justice. There are ways to engage with and participate in the 30 days of love online and here at Chalice, we are marking this time by singing, Let There Be Peace on Earth, these five Sundays. This hymn is often sung at interfaith gatherings, so we want to become more familiar with it. You are invited to join in singing.
Our Sunday worship is the shared spiritual practice of our community, and we tend to the congregation during this time by honoring our joys and sorrows. If you would like to share a joy or sorrow with the congregation this morning, now is the time for sharing in the chat box. I also want to lift up that I sent an email to the congregation yesterday asking that if you are 75 or older, that you let me know um, where you're at with getting vaccinated. And if you're having troubles getting an appointment or and, and or if you need transportation to get a vaccine, let me know. And we have congregants who are willing to help with that. I know um, as soon as I sent that email, um, they opened the vaccines to people 65 and older, not 75 and older. So suddenly all the appointments are full again. I know it's frustrating, but we do have lots of congregants who have gotten their appointments. So it just takes some patience and some determination. Don't give up. Um, um, we're all going to get vaccinated. So don't give up. Um, but if you haven't let me know about that, um, posting in the chat box is one way to let me know where you're at with your vaccines. So if you would like to send me a confidential note about your joy or sorrow or vaccines or anything, <laughs> you can email me and I'll put my email in the uh, chat box.
Wilma Jean, The Worry Machine, written by Julia Cook and illustrated by Anita Dufala. My name is Wilma Jean. Last Friday, I didn't want to get out of bed because I didn't want to go to school. So I pretended to be asleep. I think I had the worry flu. Every morning when I wake up, I feel just fine. But then my tongue gets salty. My throat gets tight. I grit my teeth because nothing feels right. My stomach feels like it's tied up in a knot. My knees lock up and my face feels hot. Worry, worry, worry. You know what I mean? I'm Wilma Jean, the worry machine. On Friday, I was worried about spelling because we had a spelling test. What if I forgot how to spell? What if everyone finishes before me? I worried about math. What if I get picked to do a problem up on the board in front of everyone? I worried about school lunch. What if we have buttered carrots and the lunch ladies make me eat them? I can't stand buttered carrots. Get up, Wilma Jean, my mom said. It's time to get ready for school. I know you're not asleep because you're making that pickle face, the one you make when you're worried about something. If you don't stop worrying so much, you're going to make yourself sick again. Too late, I thought to myself. By the time I got to school, I felt like I had swallowed an elephant playing the banjo. Luckily, I didn't forget how to spell. I didn't get picked in math, and for lunch, we had buttered corn. I love buttered corn. Then I started thinking about my afternoon. What if Aberdeen has another orthodontist appointment after lunch? Who will I play with at recess? What if I get picked last for a team in PE? What if I'm so busy getting all my homework together after school that I miss the bus and it's snowing and I don't have my boots? What if my after school snack is tapioca pudding? I can't stand tapioca pudding. Wilma Jean, honey, the lunch lady said, finish your corn. You're going to miss recess and what's wrong with your face? You look like you just bit down on a pickle. When I walked out onto the playground, I saw Aberdeen right away. Her orthodontist appointment was after school. In PE, Reggie Beck got chosen to be a team captain and he's had a crush on me for years. So he picked me first. I made it to the bus after school in plenty of time. And when I got home, my mom gave me butterscotch pudding for my snack. I love butterscotch pudding. But on Monday, my pickle face came back. Don't worry, Wilma Jean, my mother said. From now on, things are going to be different. My mom drove me to school early so we could have a special meeting with my teacher. Wilma Jean, you seem to worry a lot, my teacher said. Everybody worries about things, and worrying a little bit is a good thing most of the time. But when you worry so much that it keeps you from doing the things you want to do, we need to figure out a way to help you. I want you to tell me everything you're worried about at school. I'm going to write each worry you have down on a note card. Well, I said, I always worry when we take a test. I'm just afraid I won't do my best. I'm always scared that I'll run out of time, even though you say, ah, you'll be just fine. I worry about doing my math on the board. I might get it wrong and get a bad score. Then all the kids won't think I'm smart. And I won't get a smiley on the smiley math chart. I worry about lunch and what they'll serve. If they serve buttered carrots. I know I will hurl. I worry about worrying so much because that's all I do. I worry that I'll always have the bad worry flu. Oh, and I worry about the weather too. My teacher wrote and wrote and wrote. Then she drew a big line across the board. On the top of the line, she wrote the words, worries I can control. On the bottom, she wrote, worries I cannot control. Then she had me stick all of my worries on the board where I thought they belonged. She said, Wilma Jean, I know just what to do. I can help you get rid of your bad worry flu. The things that you worry about are easy to fix. Just let me use some of my great teacher tricks. When we take tests, 
I'll be sure to give you a little bit of extra time if you need it. If you're going to be picked for a math problem at the board, I'll give you the problem the night before so you can practice doing it at home. I'll make sure you have the lunch menu each week so you can bring a sack lunch on buttered carrot days. I can help you learn to control all of these worries, except the weather. Nobody can control the weather. For that, we need the worry hat. Put the worry hat on and think all of your worries that you cannot control into the hat. Turn the hat upside down and it will hold your worries for you. Then, if you ever want or need them back, you can put on the hat and think them back into your head. I let my teacher try out all of her tricks. Believe it or not, I was easy to fix. She taught me how to be more in control. I feel a lot better because now I just know what to do with my worries when they are inside my head. Now I'll never let worrying keep me in bed. From now on when I worry, I'll know just what to do to keep them from getting the bad worry flu. And hopefully I won't have to make the pickle face as much. The end. When we talk about traumas, one of the things that we have a tendency to do is start just in the personal, right? We start in the personal realm. What happened to me, right? Or why did, you know, and, and, the, re and the reason why I'm acting like this is because this thing happened to me. We start in the personal. And the personal is, is, is important. But I also think that um, it's what I call hip theory, H-I-P-P. -P. And that is that when somebody's personal traumas are triggered, usually it's not just the person. Um, it is why people who have certain types of personal traumas, you can have one person who has a, the same personal trauma as you, but you get so overwhelmed by it that it incapacitates you or, 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 or it makes you react in ways that are um, that seem like they're out of proportion to what it is that you're dealing with, and so I've I've come to the conclusion that many times when people are dealing with traumas, they're dealing with the historical aspects of it. So they're they're dealing with historical things. You know, there's some research that's coming out now that's starting to say that traumas actually can be transmitted up to 14 generations. Uh, 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 epigenetically, right, in the body. And, and what happens is, is that when that is going on, because trauma over time becomes decontextualized, what happens is, is that we don't have a way of explaining this, these sensations or these vibes or these thoughts or these racings or these, these, um, uh, 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 behaviors and feet. We, we don't, we, we can't, there is no current language to describe why this much overwhelm is there, right? Mm -hmm. And so, and so we figure out ways around it. And this is where I think it dovetails into addiction is that when you can't explain the, the, the sheer grief, horror, and terror of something, you're going to try and find a way around it or you internalize it and think that something is defective in you. And so what I think is, is that there are, there's these historical aspects that we need to uh, attend to. There are these intergenerational aspects that we need to attend to that get transferred down to us, not just by what people say to us in the story of the verbal story, but also in the nervous system story. How does my mama's mama's react? How does my mother's mother's nervous system react to something? And then how is that showing up in my mother's nervous system decontextualized? And then how do I learn that as personality or culture, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then there are these persistent institutional things that continue to reinforce it. And then you also have the personal trauma. Go to killabycenter.com, Radical Recovery Summit, 
For access to the interviews, you can watch them free online, or you could purchase an all-access pass, killabycenter.com. Each church year, I pick a topic for a 10-part sermon series for us to study deeply together. And we call this our spirit study topic for the year. So this year, we're working with a book called My Grandmother's Hands, Racialized Trauma and the Pathway to Mending Our Hearts and Bodies, written by trauma specialist Resma Menachem, who you just heard from. This is the fifth sermon in the series. You can find my earlier sermons in this series on our congregational YouTube channel. I've encouraged you to get the book for yourself because there are many body and breath practices offered that are important to engage with. This is where the healing comes in. And these kind of practices that I can't offer you meaningfully during our shared worship. In fact, the practices are meant to be done individually, at least as they're described in the book. Many of them call for introspection, reflection. And so again, these, are, these kinds of practices are hard for us to engage with uh, during this kind of, um, this shared worship. Chapter nine of Menachem's book is titled, Changing the World Begins with Your Body. Changing the world begins with your body. One of his central teachings is that in the United States, white bodies, black bodies, and police bodies carry unhealed racialized trauma. And this trauma impacts how we interact with each other. And of course, it impacts us physically. He writes, in many African-American bodies, this trauma has led to a variety of physical problems, the most common of which are high blood pressure, diabetes, compromised immune systems, heart problems, digestive disorders, chronic inflammation, and musculoskeletal disorders. When we measure the health and lifespans of African Americans, the aggregate results are routinely poorer than for white Americans. I'm continuing to quote him. For the past several decades, we've tried to address this one body at a time, primarily through medication, exercise programs, lifestyle changes, stress management, and other such strategies. These have had only limited success. He goes on. As any experienced trauma therapist will tell you, however, for anyone to genuinely address these health issues, the person needs to address the trauma that fuels them. Without the foundational healing, all other healing becomes difficult or impossible because the body is still stuck in the trauma. This is not just the case for African-Americans. White Americans and police officers need to mend their own trauma as well." End quote. Menachem writes about trauma that has been passed down through generations and we do need to understand that our bodies carry trauma without context as he names it. But we don't have to look far back at all to talk about trauma right now. Just a little over two weeks ago, we witnessed the attempted overthrow of our democracy. We saw the Confederate flag carried through the Capitol building. We heard about racial epithets hurled at Capitol police officers. We've learned that white supremacist groups, some from San Diego, were very involved with this attack on our government. We need to understand that an event like this and others like this impact us. And they impact us not just in our thinking brain that likes to talk and analyze, but in our vagus nerve and in our lizard brain, our amygdala. Our vagus nerve is the longest of our cranial nerves and it connects the parasympathetic nervous system. The name vagus comes from the same origins as the word vagrant, as this nerve wanders like a vagabond among our organs. Menachem calls it the soul nerve and describes it as the unifying organ of our entire nervous system, reaching into our throat, lungs, heart, stomach, liver, spleen, pancreas, 
kidney, and gut. He tells us that this he tells us that this soul nerve is where we experience a felt sense of love, compassion, fear, grief, dread, sadness, loneliness, hope, empathy, anxiety, caring, disgust, despair, and many other things that make us human. Remember uh, in the story we just heard about Wilma Jean, a lot of what she described was very physical about like sort of feeling sick, her face, she'd make a face with her worries. We have very physical reactions to, uh, to our emotions. One of the main, again, Menachem, one of the main purposes of, of our soul nerve is to receive fight, flee, or freeze messages from our lizard brain and spread them to the rest of our body. The soul nerve can also receive and spread the message of everything is okay. We're safe now, we can relax. So the vagus nerve connects to our amygdala, our lizard brain, not our thinking brain. So in previous worship services in this series, I sometimes ask you to check in with your body, to listen to your body. Things like a racing heart, hunched shoulders, a knotted stomach. These things tell us something about how we're feeling, what we're experiencing. Our thinking brain doesn't necessarily receive that information on its own. We need to learn to stop and pay attention to what our bodies are telling us. Similarly, a relaxed body tells us something about how we're feeling. In this section of the book that we're moving into, chapters 9 and 10, Menachem shares with us some body and breath practices that are meant to comfort our traumatized bodies. These are simple practices, some of them ancient. Practices like humming, singing, chanting, rocking ourselves. These are practice, practices that for many of us will just feel good, will be grounding and centering. Menachem advises that if, uh, if you're doing a, one of these practices and it brings up extreme panic or a fight, flight, or freeze response in your body, then stop what you're doing. And before considering trying the practice again, he encourages finding a somatic therapist to work with. So yes, somatic therapist is a thing. <laughs> you can look it up. I led one of these practices at a couple of meetings and uh, church meetings in the last couple of weeks. The practice is slow rocking. You rock your body side to side or back and forth, whatever feels comfortable. You can be sitting or standing, whatever feels good. He does caution that if you lay down, you might fall asleep. <laughs> so be aware of that. The only thing to remember is that the rocking should be slow. So if you are carrying anxiety and you know feelings like that, your initial impulse might be to rock fast. So you'll need to slow yourself down. If, uh, if rocking with your body doesn't feel good or you just want an alternative, you can hold your body still and rock your head and neck side to side. So while doing this, you might hum a slow soothing tune or you can play some music to listen to. Um, there are many choices on YouTube and for the, um, when I was doing this with our, our church groups, uh, I used a video called a sound bath and there's lots of them on YouTube, which are people ringing and playing crystal bowls, very um, slow and meditative. So our experience at one meeting was that this felt good and relaxing and then it was hard to shift gears and get on with the business of the meeting, but we did. At another meeting with a different group of people, our experience was that this practice brought up for people that we had trauma we wanted to uh, process together, namely the attack on the Capitol that had happened 10 days earlier. So one person described the rocking as cracking something open, even bringing up some tears. Not the extreme panic I mentioned earlier, that feeling might prompt seeking a somatic therapist to work with but it just brought up some emotions, which was okay. 
And so we actually spent that meeting talking about the attack on the Capitol because that's what felt urgent and meaningful to us. And that was the best use of our time. Our culture of white body supremacy teaches us that the messages of the body are to be ignored, not tended to, that the body is irrational and primitive and that the real work of being human happens in our thinking brain. What Resma Menachem is inviting us to know is that the body is a source of information, not something to be ignored, but something to be listened to. Our bodies, black bodies, white bodies, interact with each other, fear each other, inflict pain on each other. And they are also where we can offer comfort, support, love, and healing to ourselves and to each other. This is what it means to know ourselves, not just as thinking people, but as embodied people. For many of us, this is a new way of understanding ourselves and each other. You're invited to join in singing. The Sunday offering is an expression of the generosity that makes our congregational life possible. As Buddhist teacher Joseph Goldstein has said, it's important to understand that generosity is a practice. It's not just a single event. It's a quality in our hearts and minds that we can develop and cultivate. You're invited to text your donation to Chalice if you haven't texted a donation before, know that once you text the amount, just the numbers, you'll get a reply with a link to follow to enter your credit card information. And once you've done that once, uh, you won't need to enter it again if you make a future donation. If this Sunday donation is part of your pledge payment, please be sure to indicate the word pledge after the dollar amount. And also know that you can make a do text donation anytime uh, it doesn't need to be just during the worship service. So the phone number will be on screen in just a moment, and I'll also put it in the chat box. I hope you'll give generously.
please join in dedicating our offering with words of affirmation. Open hearts, open minds, open doors, nurturing spirits, seeking justice within the wider world. This is our mission. Less than three weeks ago, anti-democracy extremists attacked the Capitol. Less than two weeks ago, the president of the United States was impeached for a second time. Just a few days ago, we inaugurated our new president and we are entering the 11th month of a deadly global pandemic. So we are coping with and processing and surviving a lot of pain, anxiety, and traumatizing events. So I'm going to pick a few of the body and breath practices from Resma Menachem's book and email them out to you. It won't be all of them. There are 11 practices uh, just in chapter 10 because I don't think that's fair to the author, but I think it's okay to share a few so you can try them at home. Even though many of us are relieved to welcome the Biden presidency and many of our worries and frustrations can be set aside. We are still in hard times and have months and months to go. It is so wonderful to hear from those of you who have received a first vaccine dose and you know, you still need to wait a month for the second vaccine dose. A vaccine for children doesn't even exist yet. Our local hospitals, we've heard, have already had times of not being able to admit everyone who might need care. This is what the time we've been fearing. 
Uh, and an even more contagious strain of the virus is spreading and we know that we have it here in San Diego. And at this early point, um, we're certainly learning more all the time, but it appears that people who have received the vaccine are still able to spread the virus to other people. So I'm telling you all of this, not to make us more sad or more scared, <laughs> but just to remind us all now more than ever, that we need to be careful. Stay at home if you can. Do not have people come into your homes if you can avoid it. Wear a mask and maintain physical distance if you have to go out. We have made it so far already. I know I sometimes feel like I've got this, right? I've made it 10, mon 10 months, I'm just gonna keep doing what I've been doing. But this more contagious strain of the virus is out there, and I think we need to be more careful than before. We need to get to a place where we know that there's enough beds and enough personnel at our hospitals to be able to take care of people who might be sick. The survival rate for the virus is very good when people can get proper care. We know so much more now about taking care of people than we did in the early days. Uh, last year. So um, I feel like we're at this perilous point where we just need to be extra careful and see our numbers go down and see hospital beds open back up. So stay serious. Reach out to each other, help each other. Spread the good news that the vaccine is available. You just need to be a little patient and a little determined to get your appointment. We are only in the first week of the Biden administration and vaccine distribution will get better. And we'll see in our county, there will be opening and opening up more and more of the vaccine. Um, what do they call those places? <laughs> the big, the, like Petco, there will be more and more of those. So one just opened up in Chula Vista. And as they keep moving through the tiers, they'll be opening up more and more locations. We will all get vaccinated, I promise. Take naps, eat delicious foods, watch funny movies. I love you. Please join in singing. Breathe. <laughs>
Our closing words come from our Reverend Joanna Fontaine Crawford. May you go forward knowing that life is fragile and a gift, that you are lovable and loved and you are not alone. Love and blessings to each of you. Blessed be. You're invited to close our time together by singing the well. And then we have two brief announcements, total time less than four minutes. <laughs> so after our announcements, newcomers are invited to stay here in the worship for newcomer chat using the chat box. Uh, and everyone is invited to coffee hour. <laughs>